Welcome everyone. Oops. Welcome everyone to our CNPS Santa Clara Valley Garden Talk series. Tonight we will be hearing from Shelke Tao about gardening for biodiversity with native plants. I want to welcome everyone to the series and I invite people who um, are, this is their first presentation, they're new to, to our chapter to um, raise their hand or put a virtual hand up and we invite you to put in the chat how you found out about this talk. Okay. CNPS, um, you know, is a nonprofit organization. We're all over the state. We are only one of 35 chapters. And we have, our mission is all about native plants and habitats. And we focus on both science, education, conservation, and gardening to power the native plant movement. And our local chapters has a website, uh, which you can see down below. And I think our, um, our Q&A moderator will put that in the chat. And we invite you to consider joining CNPS. You support the movement to conserve California's native plant diversity. You get two very interesting journal, Flora, and which is quarterly and from Montia twice a year, which is more science oriented. We also have our local chapter. Our emblem is the Blazing Star, and that's the name of our chapter newsletter. So down at the bottom, you can see it. You, you know, you can go online and join CNPS, and there's the website. We have a lot more talks coming up. The next one is the Natural History of San Bruno Mountain, which is coming up on Wednesday, February 17th. All these talks are at 7.30. Um, and Dee Himes, who's a photographer extraordinaire, is going to give a talk about taking close-up plant ID pictures with a camera phone on February 24th. Our next gardening talk is on Wednesday, March 3rd, and Radhika Thakath will be talking about getting started with native plants. This is a great talk if you um, haven't gotten started but want to get started, she's going to have some great tips. And of course, there's going to be more talks coming. We record all of our talks and they're available on our YouTube channel. So um, there's, there's the link. Um, you can find it easier if after you go there the first time you subscribe and um, you'll see there's a lot of interesting talks and we have an older YouTube channel as well that has some interesting talks on it that when you search for CNPS SCV on YouTube, you'll see them both. And our nursery is open virtually Sorry about that. You can order online. The, the website there, our online ordering is there. And if you can't remember that, if you go to our website, there's on the, on the uh, home page, there's a link to the nursery, to the nursery ordering. We do delivery and curbside pickup, nursery side pickup can be arranged. And this, all the sales, it's a totally volunteer operation. All the sales benefit our chapter. There's also um, some of the GNGT 
um, T-shirts are available. We have books. We have um, native plant garden signs, and um, and from time to time there are from time to time plants are on sale. So check in regularly to see what's on sale. And right now there is a special Vivian, help me. D Dudley, a giveaway. Yes, we have a Dudley a giveaway as part of our raising awareness for the problem with Dudley approaching. Our Dudley is are all greenhouse grown, um, but there is a serious problem with Dudley approaching. And there's currently a bill uh, before our state legislature to provide some penalties for the poachers. And we want people to, to know about it and to support the legislation. Yeah, I mean, some of these Dudleyas are rare and some of them live in habitats that are quite limited now and people poaching them to sell is a serious problem. So also if you take pictures of Dudleyas in the wild before make, putting them public, please get rid of any location information. And the best way to find out about what's going on in our chapter is to subscribe to our news group. And you can see the subscription uh, down there. And we send announcements only once a week. Um, you get late breaking, you get the most up-to-date information on our talks by joining the uh, mailing list. And we have a team who puts these talks on tonight. Um, Vivian New is our tech is our tech person. I'm Madeline Morrow. Your your host. We have Gladys Mercier, who is our Q&A moderator. And um, Vivian's also going to help with um, help with you um, getting questions off of YouTube. So ideally, we have four people working. And we have, we are having a full program of virtual talks four times a month. And it would be great if you wanted to do something to um, help this proceed, if you considered becoming a Q&A moderator or a Zoom co-host. And the qualifications are not too strenuous. You need to have a desktop, um, be able to use a keyboard, a mouse, switch windows and copy and paste between windows. That's all you need to do and you would get training so if you can help, you can contact Johanna Kwan, as you see there, or myself. Um, Gladys is going to post those um, addresses in the chat. And if you're interested in seeing what else you can do at CNP for CNPS, if you go to our website, we typically have a help wanted. There's a lot of different ways to get involved. And so, now we're going on to tonight's program. First, some uh, general housekeeping rules. We ask that people stay muted. I'm sorry, my computer, my mouse is being hypersensitive. Um, and we're, the way we're going to do questions is that we ask you to type your questions into the chat box, whether you are in Zoom or in YouTube, we will be picking up all the questions. And we will get those questions to our presenter and um, and they will be they will be answered. And we're this program, as we said, is being recorded on YouTube. And we also record the Q&A so that can all be seen. And also if something is in chat and you'd really like to um, save it, there's three dots at the bottom of the chat box. If you click on those three dots, one of the options is to save the chat onto your own computer. You can do that at any time, but it makes sense to do it at the end. So onward with tonight's program. Shelki Tao is a landscape designer and founder of WaterEfficientGardens.com. It's a long online landscape design business focusing on low water and native plant garden designs. She is a sustainable, sustainability-driven entrepreneur committed to developing water-saving and ecosystem-friendly solutions. Prior to water-efficient gardens, 
Schelke worked over 10 years in the high-tech industry in Silicon Valley. She received her Certificate of Achievement in Environmental Horticulture and Design from Foothill College and an MBA from the Anderson School at UCLA. Schelke, it is now all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Madeline. Um, how can I share? You, I've turned it over, so you should look for your share screen. It's usually at the bottom. Oh, saw it. Yes. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Very happy to talk about biodiversity and native plants with you tonight. My name is Shoki Tao. Um, thank you, Madeline, for your introduction. Um, I'm a landscape designer and founder of watereffictiongardens.com. I have designed many native gardens and rain gardens, both online and offline. Tonight, I will be happy to share some of the gardens I designed with you. So what is biodiversity? When you look at this picture, what do you see? Many different colors of flowers, check. Many different types of plants, check. Rich in colors, check. Ocean, water, or checks. Yes, you are looking at a picture of biodiversity. Biodiversity is all the different kinds of life in one area. Animals, plants, fungi, bacteria, and microorganisms. Each of these species and organisms are like an intricate web that they work together to maintain balance and support life. The biodiversity supports everything we need, food, clean water, shelter, medicine, everything. It's really critical for us. For something that's so important, how is its status? Not very good. Since 1970, the global populations of mammals, fish, birds have declined on average 60%. In North America alone, it lost around 3 billion birds or 25% of the entire bird population. 1 million animal and plant spe species are threatened with extinction, many within the decades. If those numbers sound too abstract to you, this is something you may relate to. I can. So about 20 years, even 15 years ago, after a long distance drive, you might notice that the windshield of your car might be fully covered with the, these small insects' bodies died from the impact of the car when it was moving. Now, do you see that anymore? No more the windshield is all clean now. That tells us how much the insect population has declined in just 20 years. That's very tragic because insect is a very important um, species for us. As you can see, it's this one of the key primary consumer for the plants. It feeds to secondary consumer and higher level consumers. So it is this one very key part of the food chain and the part of this whole web. On the other hand, because it also pollinates the plants, the plants depend on the insects to um, pollinate, to have fruits and to uh, extend their spe species life to the next generation. insects were to disappear, the most flowering plants would go ex extinct too. Structure and energy flow will be altered and the food chain and food web will be collapsed, will collapse and biosphere will rot and humanity will be doomed. That's how serious the consequences will be if the insects are no longer here. In 1988, 
the concept of biodiversity was introduced. A biodiversity hotspot is a region that's both a significant reservoir of biodiversity and threatened with, the, with destruction. Currently, there are 36 regions that have been designated as biodiversity hotspots. For a region to qualify as a biodiversity hotspot, it needs to have at least 1,500 species of vascular plants from nowhere else on Earth. And more than 70% of that is lost. More than 70% of the primary native uh, vegetation is lost. California was designated in 1996. It's one of the 36 biodiversity hotspots. The California Forestic Province overlaps with most of the California state and a little bit of Baja uh, California and Oregon. It has more than 6,500 types of plants that are native to the state. More than 2,000 species of vascular plants California has, they can not be found anywhere else in the world. Uh, in the world. And more than 75% of its primary native vegetation is lost. Based on these two, that's why California qualifies. So as a Californian, that's both a good news and a bad news. Good news is that we live in a region that's very rich in biodiversity. And the bad news is that we lost a lot of that already, more than 75%. This is a photo I took at Carrizo National Monument. So that's how Central California would look like 300 years ago. Every spring, it would be this vast field of flowering meadow everywhere. Today, it is only preserved in Carrizo National Monument, the largest single native grassland remaining in California. Its size is about 2% of the Central Valley. The others, unfortunately, have already disappeared. I saw this black-tailed jackrabbit at the same place. <laughs> Later, it went into this tree stump. So we could see a little bit how biodiversity in this place is at work, where's at work. The meadow or the, or the habitat is still intact. So it gives plenty of food to the insects. With the large population of the insects here, it can feed many secondary consumers. We can use this uh, jackrabbit as a standing for that. That in turn can feed higher level consumers like hawks, coyotes, and mountain lions. And the whole full web um, can, is still pretty much robust and intact here. Why is biodiversity important? Because it supports everything in nature that we need to survive. It provides many, many services, ecosystem services, and biological services. Let's take a look at the first example, ecosystem services, or how it protects our water source. If we look at this photo, we see a lot of uh, trees, plants, mosses, and um, all kinds of bacteria and microorganisms in the water that we cannot see, but they are there. Now, if we take out the biodiversity, we take out all the trees, mosses, plants, and microorganisms, what will happen? Without the protection of these, um, the mud, the bank will just erode, and the mud will slide into the creek. So it will be very muddy. Then in the water, because there's no bacteria and microorganisms to filter and clean the water, and as a result, we will just have very muddy and dirty creek, something utterly impossible for us to use or use 
directly. Let's look at another example. For a plant to grow, it needs to have sun, water, and nutrients. So how the nutrients need to come from the soil. They come from the dead plants and animal matter, but plants cannot take them directly. Then how can they get the food? Because billions of tiny workers in the soil do that for them. And those tiny workers are microorganisms. I say billions, and that's correct. A teaspoon of topsoil can contain up to 6 billion microorganisms, including bacteria, fungi, earthworms, and termites. Soil is by far the most biologically diverse material on Earth. These microorganisms take the dead plant and animal materials, break them apart, and release nutrients inside, so plants can take them. Without these microorganisms, there will be, the world will be full of trash and nothing can grow. Also, when the plants bloom, uh, when the plants bloom, insects and birds will pollinate for them. So plants can bear the fruits and their and the species can extend to the next generation. Without the biodiversity under and above the ground, our crops will not yield, cannot yield, and we will not have the food that we eat every day. That's how important the service is for us. Well, you say, can we just keep the good eggs, the good ones, right, that are important for us and don't really care about the others? Unfortunately, no. It is a web and everything is interrelated. You can't remove one part and hoping the whole system not being impacted. If one part is removed, the other parts will collapse and the whole system cannot be nearly as productive as it used to be. To continue to enjoy the services that biodiversity provides to us, everything needs to stay strong and stay together. So facing such a crisis, what has been done? Lots of efforts have been made by agencies at different levels, nonprofit organizations and businesses. Many open spaces have been set aside and protected so we can enjoy their beauty that has not been changed by human. The state publishes and publishes an endangered plant list so um, it lists federally um, endangered and state endangered plants, um, as well as threatened and rare plants. In 2019, the state allocated a budget of 18 million on biodiversity related projects, such as seed banking, rare plants. Now, what can we do <clears throat> as individuals? One thing that we can all do that can really help is to do gardening with native plants. And the time is now. 25 years ago, in 1996, California was already de designated as a biodiversity hotspot meaning 75% of the original habitat was already lost at that time. Since then, a lot of progresses have been made, but there are still developments that made things worse, not better. We had a historical drought that took out 150 million trees. In last couple of years, every year, we have had very bad wildfires each year's wildfire was bigger than last year's. We might have all seen this news. The part of Highway 1 collapsed. Why did it collapse? Because after the wildfire, we lost the vegetation 
and without vegetation to hold the soil in place, it just collapse like that. So we can see that the loss of biodiversity really can do, can do real damage to us. And this is just one thing we could see. There's so many others that we might not see and might not know. We already know that only one or 2% of the original habitat remains today. And a big portion of that, um, a big portion of the land was developed. Now for the lands developed um, for residential uh, purposes, we know that two thirds of all the residences in California are single family homes. That means collectively, we have a very big space that we can control how we use it. If every homeowner can devote some space to native landscaping, let's just say everyone can do na native landscaping in their front yard like this. And we assume each front yard is 1,000 square feet. Collectively, we will have a space of about 180,000 acres. How big is that space? If we imagine there is a band um, that is uh, 475 yard wide, the band can go from the very north all the way to the very south of California. And how wide is 475 yard? That's almost five football fields. Um, we know each football field is 100 yard wide. So 475, 4.75 football fields, very wide. Just imagine how much native plants can fit in that space and how many bees, birds, all kinds of rabbits, hawks, wildlife we can save with this space. We can all do um, in the space, in our space, to restore, um, we can all do gardening in our space to restore the web. When I got this project um, to design garden for this uh, front yard, as you can see, it's full of the weeds. Um, I remember the meadow I saw well, and I determined that um, I want to bring a corner of that to this new garden. So that's what I did. This is how the garden looked um, when it was first installed. So I put in all native plants and uh, built two uh, rain gardens and this dry river creek uh, meandering through the, uh, the garden and connects everything. This is where I put the meadow, this, this area. And after just two months, the meadow is shape, was shaping up. And when spring came, about four months after we put in the garden, four to five months, that's the meadow. And when summer came along, even bigger. From the very first flower that appeared in the garden, it attracted um, the bees and all kinds of other wildlife, the bird, the hummingbird. Um, here I have a video and I can uh, oh, I can only do that in that. Okay. So every time when I went visiting this garden, I always heard, heard the chirps you just heard. And I always saw some kind of um, bees or, or birds. Um, so you can see that a native garden from day one, it already can boost the biodiversity in the area, in the space. One thing we might want to remember is that um, 
70 percent. That's what the replacement uh, rate is to sustain um, native landscaping. If it goes under 70 percent, um, it's the replacement rate is not enough to sustain above the model area. So um, for if we want to do native landscaping, we should strive for a 70% uh, native plants uh, for, for the space, for the garden. We just learned about why insects are so important um, for the biodiversity. So when we do a native garden, we should use biodiversity um, rock star trees and plants, uh, specifically the trees and plants that can support lots of um, bugs or insects. Here you can see there are three trees, coast live oak, ginkgo, and um, crane myrtle. Can you guess which tree supports most species of caterpillars? Now, caterpillar is something, it's a type of uh, uh, insect. It's the main food for birds. If we want to see a big bird population, then we must have a big population of caterpillars. Um, so that's how important um, the, the trees and caterpillars are to the biodiversity. The answer is this. Coast live oak supports 270 different species um, of caterpillars. Ginkgo, zero. Cray myrtle, zero. 90% of the insects that eat plants can only eat the plants with, with which they co-evolved. Why is that? Because all plants, they all have a certain level of toxins. That's their way, um, their mechanism of self-protection. When the insects co-evolve co with those plants, they have they develop their own mechanisms to deal with those toxins. So they they can eat them and, and be doing okay. But the insects that do, did not co-evolve with the plants, they did not have that kind of mechanism and they cannot deal with it. Eucalyptus is not a native tree. It's introduced from Australia during gold rush as a way to grow lumber and um, fast. But um, later it was found out um, some of those lumber actually could not fit the bill and could not be used that well uh, for railroads and, and things like that. But to grow them, a big space of the natural vegetation was taken out. And as you can see here, originally it might be all the native trees and plants like a toyong and coast live oak, but instead those were cleaned out and put in these um, uh, eucalyptus trees. But compared to coast live oak, that could support 270 uh, different species of caterpillars, the eucalyptus can only support about five. So if you imagine there are about like, let's say 10, right, coast live oaks there. So collectively they can support thousands of caterpillars. But here with these eucalyptus trees, they might only support, let's say uh, dozens, less than 100. So that's a big loss for the biodiversity. And that's how important to have native plants for us. These are some of the uh, rock star native plants for, um, for insects. Um, coast live oak, we just talked about, manzanita, um, the, uh, the lamina verbena, uh, the uh, penstemon, ribes, Cleveland sage, cyanothus, California native milkweed, Bee bliss sage, fuchsia, poppies, uh, golden poppy, and martilija poppy. One thing I would like to call out is uh, this is a native milkweed. 
Many people would like to support monarch butterflies and want to include um, milkweed in their garden. That's very, that's, that's good. But we can also remember there is a California native milkweed. And when possible, we should use this native um, milkweed so that it can better support uh, the local insects. We can also use our garden to save endangered and threatened native plants. This is a picking marsh lily, this, um, this plant um, in the news release for the state budget. When I did a hike um, in LA about two years ago, I was lucky enough to see this picking marsh lily in the wild. It was absolutely gorgeous. So when I designed this garden, I also included the lily uh, in the plants. I planted about five of them here. When I got the bulbs, I was really doubtful whether they could grow. They all look very dry and dead like, like that, just one brown stitch, um, stick like that. And um, no other, no leaves, nothing. And because they are already in danger in nature. So I really was doubtful whether they could grow in, in the garden. This is after about two or three months and this plant already grows so big, but then the lilies, they still were nowhere to be seen, um, still under here. Um, you can see all these uh, drip, drip irrigation and nothing came out yet. But after about one month, they came out. So these are the lilies. And when summer came, they all bloomed. Just beautiful as in the nature. So this is when they um, first uh, came out from the soil, um, when they bloomed. In August, uh, end of August, they all faded. And everyone was thinking, well, yeah, that's nature, right? Um, you can't have flowers bloom all the time. So we just need to wait till next year. But nature always has its magic. In October, the plant grew bigger and bloomed again. So as you can see, these two plants, they first bloomed in June and then they faded in August but then grew bigger and taller and bloomed again in October. So how, who would know such magic? But it, it, it happened in the garden. So from endangered in nature to grow it successfully in, in the garden, um, the homeowner and I, we were both very happy that we did something to save this endangered plant. Another example is the Franciscan manzanita. So um, everyone thought it was already extinct. Um, but in 2010, a botanist, um, he spotted the plant and found out it's the Franciscan manzanita, the only one survived. So, um, after that, um, you can see people used a crane to lift it out and protect it. Today, many with the propagation, many nurseries propagated and make it available. So you can buy it from nurseries. So when you need a, a ground cover manzanita, you can consider the Franciscan manzanita so that we can help save it and not uh, for it not to be an endangered plant anymore. We should avoid invasive plants. We know that um, the, this habitat, we, we lost it. We lost it not only to developments, we also lost it to invasive plants. So this beautiful meadow uh, on the beach. Um, two years later, when I went back to visit it again, um, it was very sad to see that
that um, a big portion of that was over, overtaken by the ice plants. Um, that's really bad. And we could not, if we go back later, we could not see this flower ring meadow again, in that, at least in that part. So it's just a big loss. Um, after a space is invaded, the biomass can reduce 96%. That's huge. Um, so you can see how bad um, it is to the biodiversity after a space is invaded by these kind of uh, plants. These are the invasive plants that we should avoid the ice plant, the pampers grass, periwinkle, and the ivies. If we have them in the garden, we should take, remove them. We can also reduce or lose lawn, lose our lawn if we have it. If you look at this picture, which says biodiversity better? Long is the opposite of biodiversity. It only has one plant, the grass, one color, green. It doesn't attract bees, birds, or butterflies. And it takes a lot of water. So when I got this project, um, you can see this is a backyard. It was full of, it, it was just this big long. So um, the homeowner and I, we agreed that we would take mo um, most of the lawn out. We kept a small piece, but then the others, we just uh, removed that and replaced with lots of native plants. This is a bay laurel um, and the cyanothus and the lamina verbena. This is the um, milkweed. Yes, we wanted to use a, a native milkweed, but then it's something the owner grew, grew himself. So when we install the garden, we just use it in the garden. So same thing for the front yard. Uh, we remove the, the lawn and put in all the native plants. At the rain garden, a rain garden can be so can provide so many benefits to our environment. Instead of letting the rainwater run off, it will capture it, clean it, filter it, um, water the plants inside, and then let it go back, um, go down to the soil and replenish our groundwater. Rain gardens can help biodiversity in two ways, two big ways in the soil biodiversity and the plant biodiversity. Soil, um, because we always use some compost um, for rain gardens. Now, compost has a lot of org organic matters. Mix that with the rainwater, it creates an excellent environment for the microorganisms to grow. If they could speak, they might say something like, oh, I really love this environment. With with that, the soil quality can be improved. And with a good soil, all kinds of plants can grow too. And with the plants, um, they can attract uh, the bees, birds, and butterflies, and all the other wildlife. And as a whole, it can just boost the biodiversity. So as you can see, we can put native plants in the garden and in the rain garden. And together they can make the whole space, um, a good biodiversity space. We can use native plants in all kinds of space and garden styles. 
Some people might say, I don't have a big front yard or backyard. Well, you can still do native landscaping. Here is a backyard for a condo, not a very big space. But still, we could be putting this eastern rabbit and all these other um, native plants. Um, usually, we would use western rabbit here in California, but because um, it's multi trunk and the homeowner wanted to have a small tree, so we went with um, this eastern rabbit. But they are very closely related and still supports most of the um, uh, bugs and insects that western. Uh, rabbit supports. If you have a patio, you can do container planting. And the native plants can totally do, um, can totally grow well in containers. Um, this is a boulder garden that I designed. The native plants, they fit right in because that's the how the nature is, where they come from. This is the Hakone, Hakone Japanese garden. And this is the plant, manzanita, at the entrance. So as you can see, it fits right in with the Japanese garden, total harmony. So native plants can be used in all kinds of space for all kinds of style, garden styles. leave the leaves and stumps in the garden because that's how nature works. The leaves branch uh, branches and the tree stumps, for us, that might be not, for us, that might be useless, but for the, uh, my, uh, the all kinds of microorganisms in the soil, that's, that's their food, they rely on them. So we can just leave them, them there and let that, um, let those uh, tiny workers work their magic and then use those to improve the soil quality. Um, take those apart, become and transform those into the food that um, these trees and plants can take in. By um, in restoring the biodiversity in soil, we can also restore the biodiversity above the ground. Well, after a garden is built, enjoy your native garden. When we have a native garden, it's like we have a corner of nature in our yards. We can watch the nature up close and can witness many small miracles. When we put in this manzanita in around uh, September, we all thought we need to wait at least one to two years before we could see it bloom. But actually it bloomed after just four months. This picture was uh, taken uh, a couple of weeks ago. So, um, and it bloomed quite, quite a bit, not just uh, one or two. So um, the manzanita, it would bloom the first winter after you put that in. So that's quite amazing. Here, um, the homeowner wanted to have um, sunflowers. So um, because I knew there was a, there's this uh, California native sunflower, so I used that. At first, it was really tiny. I did not take the full, it's somewhere here, you could not even see. And then after a couple of weeks, it grew a little bit, bit bigger. And after that, it really grow. It's like you can see it's change every day. So this is like a mid September. By early November, it grew to eight feet tall and, blew, and bloomed like this. And when the flowers um, are there, the bees are there too. You can see how our garden changes with time and season, um, spring, summer, and fall. So we can 
sit back, um, enjoy them, take lots of photos, videos, share that, tell that to friends, and also just spread the news that how lovely a native garden is. This morning, um, when I drove by this place, um, I saw that um, it's a pretty big space, but then all these plants, although they are drought tolerant, they are not native plants. Um, this rosemary and heather hawthorns. So if we could replace these plants with native plants, um, we can have much bigger biodiversity benefits. So we can all work together to put more native plants in our gardens. We can do it right now. We can use rock star trees and plants, save some endangered and threatened native plants, avoid invasive plants, reduce or lose our lawn at a rain garden, use native plants in all kinds of space and styles, and leave the leaves and stem in the garden. And when we all work together and do this, uh, remember that big band, right, across the state, we can have so much native plants, and with that, so much wildlife and biodiversity in our state. Hopefully we can improve the 25% to a percentage much higher so that California will really become a this place of rich biodiversity. Um, you're welcome to um, visit my website, uh, watereficientgardens.com and follow me on uh, Water Efficient Gardens, um, Instagram and uh, Facebook. I'm also happy to leave my contact information in the chat. Okay, I'm open for questions. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Shelky. Um, Gladys, how are you doing um, on tracking the questions? You we definitely have some questions. Can you all hear me okay? Yep, I can. Yes. Let me get that going here. Okay. Let's see, let's go back to the top of the list. Um, Shelke, you had shown some pictures of a meadow at the coast and you showed a before picture and an after picture where the ice plant mm -hmm. had taken over. Do we know what flowers were lost in that meadow? I, I can talk about that if you don't know, if you don't have the list Shelke. I don't. Yeah, uh, go ahead, please. Because that was a great example of California coastal prairie, a highly yeah. endangered habitat. And um, it's a mix of native grasses. There's the um, Erigeron glaucus, the seaside aster. That's probably paintbrush. Uh, the little yellow might be gum plant. You could look up California coastal prairie and see species lists. The pink Anybody have an idea what, oh, that's the um, Armeria, the sea thrift. There's also many grasses in the prairies. There's um, um, Calamagrosta des Champia, a beautiful um, grass. In this one, I guess it's early in the year and what's most evident are the flowers, but there's also grasses. You will also find Dudleyas in these coastal prairies. Um, it's a very endangered habitat. And I know there's some chapters in California Native Plant Society that work hard on restoring them. An ice plant is just a horrible plant. It takes constant vigilance to keep it under control since that whoever in their infinite wisdom decided it was a good thing to take, bring to us. But some of these things are available. Actually, a number of these flowers are available in the nursery trade. A rigoron glaucus, seaside um, daisy or seaside aster, the gum plants, the uh, native, our native armeria. Um, paintbrush is a little harder to grow. Anybody who can grow paintbrush is a real master of native plant gardening. And um, we have Dudleyas available in nurseries as well. I mean, if anybody else has anything to say about the coastal prairie, that you know, could be helpful. 
Um, Shelke, do you have the dates of those two photos? Like when, when was it looking good? And then when was it all ice plant? I think this was 96, um, uh, sorry, <laughs> 2016. And this is 18, I think. Oh, just two years. I, yeah, I can double check, but I think that's the dates I remember. Okay, okay. Okay, so there's a question here for, um, we want to know what, you showed a picture that had plants in the rain garden as well as outside of it. What mm -hmm. type of plants go in that rain garden? So I put in the California um, uh, ester. And Aster. yeah, that's the scarlet monkey flower. And I also put in some Douglas irises. So that's in the uh, rain garden outside, um, the golden poppy, um, the fuchsia, uh, and the Dolamina verbena. This is the manzanita. Okay. Okay, uh, let's see. Here is a question. Um, somebody says, my neighbor just got rid of his eucalyptus trees. So mm -hmm. now there's more sun than can get to our plants, and it, but it's on a hillside. Is a manzanita a good tree to plant in that location? In other words, sunny hillside. Yes, if it's sunny hillside, yes, it's very good for manzanitas. Okay. And let's see. Another question. Oh, you showed some containers. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have recommendations for plants in those containers? Um, uh, best species for containers. I, I have seen quite quite a few containers uh, with um, monkey flowers. I think that would be a good one. Um, another one is the penstemon. The BOP penstemon. That's another good one. Fuchsia. Um, I would think that's good too. California fuchsia. Okay. Uh, can okay. can I, I just, I just want to say about monkey flowers, if monkey flowers have failed for you in the garden, plant them in containers. Mm -hmm. They're really, really happy in containers. I have, this is, here's my monkey flower in a container and it blooms 10 months of a year. Okay, so while we're on the container and rain garden questions, um, can you just explain what the rain garden is a little bit? Is there standing water all the time in there or is it underground? What makes it a rain garden? <laughs> <laughs> so a rain garden is uh, this shallow depression that takes the water from downspout um, and have plants in them. So um, a rain garden is not a pond. The rainwater should go down very quickly. If um, rain, uh, the water pools or stays, then it's not a good rain garden. Mm. Um, the purpose of rain garden um, is to improve the soil. Okay, um, several things. One is that uh, reduce the runoff of the rainwater, right? Um, in cities nowadays, we have so many uh, impermeable services, uh, impermeable surfaces <laughs> that um, mm -hmm. so the flood hazard can be pretty bad, um, especially with the storms. Now, um, with rain garden, that rainwater is diverted into this area, so the flood, uh, the hazard can be reduced. Mm -hmm. um, another thing is that. Um, with the rainwater, it will um, soak down into the soil. And as I just explained, um, when it mix with the um, compost, it creates this very nice environment for the uh, microorganisms. Um, so the soil quality can be improved um, quite significantly. And then uh, the rainwater will um, soak down into the uh, all the way down and replenishes our um, groundwater. That's also another very significant role that it plays. Um, we, the groundwater is our is this big reservoir of water. 
in the last drought, um, actually we pump quite a bit of water from, uh, from that uh, underground water. Mm -hmm. uh, it's estimated that um, it takes many, many years for that water to go back to its original level. Mm -hmm. And as water is so important for us, right? And you can see how important it is to uh, keep the healthy level of underground water. Mm -hmm. So the rain garden allow us to do that. It remove the water from runoff, but let it go back to underground. Mm -hmm. And also with a good soil, we can uh, grow all these plants and become a habitat for all kinds of wildlife. And that's where we can get the biodiversity. Mm -hmm. So there's a person saying that they have a bioswale drainage route that runs at the bottom of a hill in their backyard. Would that be a good place to create a rain garden then? Yeah, I would think so. Um, I think whenever possible, always put a rain garden um, because it has plants. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yes, other things can also let the water go down, right? But then with the plants, from this talk, you know, with plants, mm -hmm. the insects will come and all the other wildlife will come. So yeah. from the biodiversity perspective, it's always good to put in plants, always good to have a rain garden. Mm -hmm. So someone's asking about the laundry to landscape setup. I think this means when you have your runoff from your mm -hmm. laundry, your washing mm -hmm. machine into the landscape, can that water be useful for a rain garden? So, um, I, I did the training for gray water and we're set, certified um, for the gray water um, installation. In the training, um, they said it's, uh, the rainwater is not supposed to mix with the gray water. Mm. Um, <laughs> to, to tell the truth, I still did not quite get it. I think they, they kind of felt the gray water, um, it should just go um, directly to the plants that need to be um, wa watered um, without any diversion. So it's like from gray water, from laundry water directly to whatever plants um, that, um, that it should go to. Um, I, I have, I've seen it in gardens. I mean, one of the things, th some things that do well with gray water are some trees and, um, and shrubs. And so typically people have it diverted to an area where it's watering, some people have it watering fruit trees, which is, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's an acceptable use. Um, fruit trees that aren't too sensitive to salt. You can find lists of these plants. You can have shrubs, but typically you're keeping gray water percolation is separate from your rainwater percolation. As Shelky said. Mm -hmm. And that's a whole other talk. Yeah. Which we should we should do again. Okay. So while we're one last question about the rain garden. Someone's asking about what is a French drain and is that somehow useful for a rain garden? No, that's not a rain garden. It's just a drain. Um, I think the big distinction is that it doesn't have plants in it. Mm. Um, a rain garden always should have plants in it. So um, yeah, as I said, if possible, always try to put in a rain garden, put in some plants. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so let's see, there's a question about converting our front yard to natives, but we're also interested in the laundry to landscape as a way of drought proofing our yard. Would you advise skipping gray water for a rain garden, I think we talked about that, or can gray water systems support interesting riparian natives? Um, I think it can. Yeah, there's some plants um, that, that, um, that can be supported, but mainly the gray water, um, usually people use that the biggest um, usage uh, actually is for fruit trees. Um, mm. The ones that need a lot of water, um, that's where um, 
yeah, the gray water can be great for. Okay. Well, one of the things that maybe they could grow, I have a rain garden where I get a lot of water in there and I have the red twig dogwood, Cornus sericea, and you could probably put that in gray water because they say shrubs will work too, but it is true. Most of the time when I've seen them in yards, it's for fruit trees. Mm. Okay. Uh, Stephanie put some information in the chat about the Santa Clara Water Valley District and their gray water rebate information. Uh, so people could look at that. So let's go on to somebody would like recommendations on evergreen trees that can be used to screen between homes that are two stories high and there's very limited space and there's a patio and a fence and we need low root damage potential. <laughs> so two story homes, very little space in between, but can you put something in there to screen? I would say um, consider a Western rabbit um, that might, um, but it's not evergreen. So that's a problem. Mm. I um, would recommend holly leaf cherry, holly which leaf. is evergreen. Mm -hmm. And you can prune it to any shape you want. Mm -hmm. It's not super fast growing, mm -hmm. but you know, if you want good roots, you don't get good roots with fast growing. You have to be patient. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, we got more questions coming in. And let's see. So here's one. It says, we have a so-called bioretention area strip along a long driveway fence. It is required by the city because the water drains into the bay. What plants would you recommend? Right now, only three bottle brush have survived. I guess, Callistamon. Uh, the grasses didn't make it. So this is that strip along a long driveway? Um, I would say um, consider deer grass. <laughs> it's one very tough um, grass um, that can grow pretty much everywhere. Um, manzanita, um, that, that can also pretty much grow anywhere. Um, Cianothus, um, that's a little bit more picky, but if um, it grows uh, initially, it can grow well later. So, um, and these plants, they also have pretty big coverages, so may fit for that area. Okay. Uh, we are going back to the rain garden. Um, when there is no rain, do you need to water the rain garden? Yes. 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 <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Just like other native plants in the first one or two years, you need mm -hmm. to water them until they establish. Okay. And there was a question about the red twig dogwood that was recommended, I think by Madeline. Was that in the rain garden or was that for the gray water? Well, as I wrote, um, it works really well in the rain oh. garden, and I believe it would work well in gray water as well. It's very adaptable. It's uh, very tough. It needs more water than it's a riparian plant. So I think riparian plants will do well in gray water as well if you put water in there regularly. Red twig dogwood can take regular water. Okay. Um. Okay, so there's some questions about our little workers in the soil, like the earthworms and the earwigs and things. And then there's pests, which are like aphids and even rats. Are there any good versus bad? Which ones are good versus bad for growing native gardens? I guess I'm not sure I understand that question. Um. Which ones are good versus bad for growing native gardens? Um, 
the bugs. I, well, I have to protect all my new plants against rabbits. I've got quite a collection of little wire cages mm -hmm. so they can survive till they're big enough to, um, to manage a little nibbling. Mm -hmm. And rats are invasive, but I don't, they don't bother my native plants. Yeah. I don't know, Shelky, what's your experience? <laughs> I have um, two clients after the new gardens were installed. They both told me that deer <laughs> came from the mountain and ate off <laughs> the new plants. Oh. And, they, and they had to put uh, nets um, to protect them. Um, yeah. I don't know about the good versus the bad ones. <laughs> Okay. I think for native plants, right, they, they are native here. So they are adapted to the soil uh, in these kind of conditions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, back now we're on to rabbits as Madeline introduced rabbits. Can you recommend rabbit proof plants for coastal sage chaparral? Nothing is rabbit proof when it's young. Nothing. Nothing. I had I planted a white sage. If you know about white sage, Salvia apiana, it's the most strongly scented sage anywhere, I think. I thought nothing will eat that. A little plant, I went out, I saw something had nipped it, said, oh, that doesn't taste good. So I planted a new one and I put a cage around it. Okay. So if you have rabbits, you've got to have a collection of little chicken wire circles that you can protect your plants with, uh, you know, or get a dog. I don't have a dog. <laughs> People with dogs don't tend to have rabbit problems. Yeah. Or squirrel problems. But I think it's the rabbits that kill my young plants, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for watering natives in their first year, is there a schedule that you recommend in their first year? Do you need to give them additional water throughout that first year to get them established? This is so hard to answer because every plant, they are so different. <laughs> <laughs> I would say there are some plants, they definitely don't like too much water during the summer, mm. even, even the first summer. Mm. Um, I have seen some cyanotheses, they really don't want that extra water, but others take it fine. Um, I would say always err on the caution side and don't overwater it. Um, like twice a week for most plants should be, should be probably enough. Um, I, I have had several gardens that some plants, they just could not take as much water in summer and they, they fade off because of that. Mm -hmm. um, I would say try to control really how much the water um, for each, um, well, for, for those plants. Okay. Uh, how about ground cover or mulch? Do you have a recommendation for that? I'm seeing a lot of mulch in your photos, I think. Yeah, because for the new garden, um, for, for people who, especially for people who apply for the rebates um, of valley water, that's a requirement. Mm. Um, so you must cover it with mulch. And that actually fits with what we talked tonight for biodiversity too, right? Mm -hmm. Because the mulches, they are um, organic matters and that's the uh, material, the nutrients that um, the microorganisms need to, to break down and transform into nutrients. Mm -hmm. mm. Ground cover, I think any um, manzanita, cyanothus, those plants ground cover, of course, th those, would be, those would be great because they are plants themselves mm -hmm. and help you cover the ground. Mm -hmm. There are some forms that are low, low and spreading. Yes, actually quite a few, yeah. Do you have a type of mulch that you would recommend or does it depend on the area? Um, I think anything organic would be good. 
and different people, I found out they just have different preferences for mm. the size and color. Mm. Um, usually I would just suggest um, like the bark, um, the mulch that's made from bark, tree bark. But other than that, I think you can, whatever you prefer, <laughs> that, that, that will work. Okay, okay. Okay, so let's see. What are three native flowering plants that will thrive in partial shade? We are north facing in Sonoma County. Um, I just, mm -hmm. Go ahead. <laughs> I also just typed a bunch into the chat. Okay. Didn't, so oh, what, didn't are your, <laughs> what are your suggestions? Um, I think the ribes would be a good one. Um, yeah. They, yeah, they like shade person. Another one actually is this one, Carpinteria. Um, another plant that likes that kind of condition. Um, corral bells, they like shade. Mm -hmm. um, okay. How about, there's a question about California native bunch grass. Any comments or recommendations about that? Mm, I haven't used too much of that. Um, yeah, I, yeah, this one I have not had any experience, so cannot really recommend or um, add any comments. I have a meadow, but you know, there's a whole lot of different bunch grasses for different environments. So it kind of depends on your environment. Shoki, you mentioned um, deer grass, which is a large bunch grass. Mm -hmm. And it's, 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 it's um, cast iron, easy plant. Um, I, there's California fescue, Idaho fescue, which may or may, which kind of tiptoes into California. And there's that, um, the one, the seaside one, Calamogrostis, which is really beautiful. That it were, it, you need a somewhat partial shade or cooler place for it. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, Calscape, I think, would help you with looking up the grasses and figuring out which one would grow well for you. Mm -hmm. Because what they need is really different. They work, some work in shade, some work in sun, some need a lot of water, some need very little water. There's so many of them you can't, but I mean, deer grass has to be on the top of the list as being an indestructible plant that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, someone says they have raccoons and they tear up everything. Would they tear up deer grass? Um, I have raccoons and they don't touch them. Uh, any other recommendations about Raccoons. I don't know. Rac I get raccoons, but they go to my fish pond. I never saw them until I put in a fish pond. Ah. So another question about bark. Is there anything other than wood bark mulch that can be used? I have issues with a neighborhood cat using the area. Uh, can you use very fine compost? Um, yes, you can, right? But the purpose of mulch is to, to cover the ground so that the water would not evaporate easily. So that way, if you save water and also provide um, the organic, organic matter for the microorganisms, if you just use compost, that, that's kind of bare soil. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Maybe bigger, larger bark pieces would deter cats. I there's some conversation in the chat about large bark for cat problems, but I think once cats pick an area they like, they will come back. Motion activated sprinklers. 
Yeah. Um, Some yeah. people like pebbles or pea gravels. Um, yes. Maybe some big pebbles, if you can, you like the look of that. Um, I don't know how much it can deter the cat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think we might be. Yeah, uh, someone's con. Well, that's Madeline's comment. Once the mulch grows, or once the plants grow, you don't really see the mulch so much. And they do grow fast. I did plant my first set of natives this October, and it's been only four months, and they're all like two, three times bigger than when I planted them. As you showed in your photos, Shelky, they grow very quickly when they're happy. Mm. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So I don't think I see other questions unless I missed one and somebody. Um, wants to repost, but I think we got most of those. And it is 850 so. Mm. Oh, here's one. I have a gigantic redwood tree on my property. How should I maintain it? Is Care it, for it. Is it healthy now? What's its status? Um, yes, very healthy. Then, <laughs> then maybe you don't need to do too much. <laughs> maybe he's, it's happy there. Yeah, what I can think of is that in like in our last drought, right? If it's really dry, then maybe mm. give it some water. Mm -hmm. But other than that, it's a native, it's healthy. So yeah, then just let it be. Mm -hmm. uh, the comment is that um, my, it says, my understanding is that redwood trees have very shallow roots. And if it falls, then it will crush many houses. Um, do they have shallow roots? Yes, they have really shallow roots and it's hard to plant under them. They really are not great landscape trees, but okay. people are attached to them. And yes, if it falls, it will crush many houses. I mean, yeah. you could, but, but the only thing, oh. sorry, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, I, cause I have a lot of redwood trees in, in my yard. And the thing about their roots is they are shallow, but they extend really far like they're probably in your neighbor's yard as well as your own yard and uh, they're probably actually less likely to fall than oaks you know and where I live in Menlo Park my neighbor has a lot of problems with uh, the older oaks starting to rot and falling but we also have a lot of redwoods and no redwood as far as I know has ever fallen okay so a question just came in about um, HOAs, those homeowner associations. How do you deal with a homeowner association that is unhappy with native gardens? Well, invite them to talks like this <laughs> <laughs> for them to see the beauty of native plants. Yeah, um, this talk is going to be on YouTube. You could have a showing for them. Try and educate them. And also in the last drought, they passed a state law that homeowner associations cannot require people to um, water if there are regulations against it. I don't know if they passed anything about vegetation, but um, mm -hmm. I don't know if they all know that, but it was a law that overrode certain homeowner association regulations. And I believe that's still in effect. Mm -hmm. So hopefully, eventually, um, we can overcome them. But I think education is the best way. Agreed. <clears throat> so when uh, you have the low spreading ground club, ground club, sorry, ground cover, what is the best? What's your favorite best low spreading ground cover instead of mulch? I really just like manzanita. <laughs> manzanita, okay. They are so beautiful and they bloom 
and they can grow quite easily. Mm -hmm. Is there a certain uh, variety or species that you prefer that you found grows quickly enough? I think people, when they have ground cover, they want to have it spreading. The Francis, the Franciscan one. Francisca? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That, hey, <laughs> that's a, uh, right? Um, you help save an endangered mm -hmm. plant. Mm -hmm. And it is good. Um, I also talked with um, other um, uh, like nursery owners and other people. They all say that Franciscan uh, manzanita actually is one of the best perform performing mm -hmm. manzanitas in the area. Excellent. So, yeah. Well, I had trouble with it in hot areas. I found if you have a hotter area, I found Carmel Soar is an excellent low growing manzanita for places that where others, because I have some pretty hot areas of my yard and Carmel Soar has performed like a champ. Whereas the other ones kind of sulk and they want afternoon shade. Now this is Carol on my computer. I can't type anymore, but I've got uh, had pigeon point, coyote brush, dwarf, and regular. And in fact, I've just cut it, cut it out and back. It was doing very well. One plant had died out, but the other one just grew like gangbusters and is, was a great ground cover all over the place. <laughs> yeah, you have to cut that back to keep it fresh periodically. Yeah, I trim it. I trim it back, but it did very well. It did better for me than the manzanita did. And and I'm I'm also a big fan of Warner Lytle buckwheat in um, hotter locations, and it attracts so many pollinators. Okay, uh, let's see, we've got one more question that came in about preparing the land for a native garden. How deep do you dig down to work with the soil? A few feet. My front lawn soil is practically as dense as rock, starting only about six inches down. It's just like you plant other plants, right? You're just deep enough for you to put in the root ball. A root ball size. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah, a small tree then needs to go deeper, but mm -hmm. the perennials not not as much. Mm -hmm. So no special preparation. No, really. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. That might be all of our questions. Um. The name of the buckwheat is right there in the chat. <laughs> I spelled it correctly this time. That's a big word. <laughs> okay. Kathleen Vermani says she prepped with sheet mulching over lawn. And I have to say that all, I did that too. And it really helps your soil. It attracts lots of microorganisms and worms and things like that. And it starts preparing, repairing the soil because lawns are f actually usually abuse the soil. Mm -hmm. you, have, you have to have mulches and let the leaves drop and things like that to start the process of letting the natural processes start. Mm -hmm. And Vivian has a great handout on that also for planting plants. The mud method. Mm -hmm. I planted with the mud method and my everything is going gangbusters. Nothing did poorly. I'm shocked. Even my tiny manzanitas, the little blist ones, have little itty bitty flowers all over them right now. Amazing how quickly that happens. Okay, well, I want to thank Shelke for an amazing um, talk. It will be up on YouTube, um, you know, probably tomorrow, maybe a couple days. And so if you have friends who say, 
well, why should I use native plants? Encourage them to watch this presentation. Actually, it's available because on YouTube it, now, Madeline. It, oh, okay, immediate. great. <laughs> it's immediate, all right. So um, thank she you. lays out the issues so well, so thank you very much. Thank you, my pressure. And I hope to see you all at some of our next, at our next, um, our next talk. Good night, everyone. Good night.